We are having Jerry Gadell to comment about the recovery in corn and soybeans, the weather in the United States, and yet uh, his own estimates for the USDA's July report. He promised that uh, he will be more of uh, an advocate uh, this turn, this time around. So he is here on Connected Farmer, your channel to keep you up to date with the latest trends in agriculture and livestock. Stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe. Hello, Jerry. So let's start by the market. Uh, wow, what what are you seeing here? Well, you know, last week we were uh, the, the combination of numbers uh, on the uh, June thirtieth report, and that we had a very strong reaction. We kind of backed off a little bit. Then we uh, the weekend, uh, and it was a three day weekend, and they're always notorious for having things change pretty dramatically. In that, and in this case. Uh, uh, the, there was ideas of rain coming for this coming week, but they intensified the amounts and pushed them further west and actually included Iowa <coughs> in these estimates this time uh, with some substantial one to uh, three inch rains uh, in that area. And that's uh, definitely a positive if that does occur. At this point, we've had kind of streaky conditions most of this week and the four days of trading. Uh, of rain activity. It hasn't really been as concentrated as the forecast had, but you know, uh, uh, the temperatures finally have uh, backed off a little bit here and moved move further west. And that in the, in the backdoor coal fan has came into the Eastern Corn Belt and that, and then it uh, actually impacted some of Iowa's uh, areas here uh, and, and that even in uh, Southwest, uh, or Southeast, I should say, South Dakota. So, but, uh, you know, that's the feature that we're dealing with. This is definitely a, a weather market kind of situation. Everybody kind of quickly uh, makes their judgments as to how much rain will be helpful and that. And uh, so uh, we backed all the way back off here. Uh, we're approaching some key support there on the corn and the uh, new, new crop corn, new crop beans uh, at the $5 level. Uh, and the $12 level on beans. So uh, we'll see what this thing uh, pro projects on Monday. I've got some theories that maybe the USDA might change. Yeah, so we are coming from some months that uh, we, are play we were playing with some uh, limits with the both soybeans and corn. And now we are surrounding a uh, uh, regular level of prices. So do you think, how do you think is, this is going to play out uh, for the coming weeks? Well, uh, of course, the first thing we'll, the, we'll get an update on here is how's the USDA really going to look at this uh, U.S. crop here? Uh, we've had a very significant uh, dry situation west of the Mississippi, and particularly on what is called the U.S. Drought Monitor. Uh, North and South Dakota, much of uh, Minnesota, and a uh, significant portion of Iowa and, and, and that and other states have had some pretty dry conditions, even parts of Northwest Illinois at times uh, from there. And to some extent, that should... Uh, the, the interesting twist about it is, of course, we, have, we look at the short-term situations on this stuff, but the drought monitor is one of these things that the USDA has put together, or I should say the National Weather Service and, and NOAA in the U.S. to monitor the situation where we're looking at the subsoil moistures and the topsoil moistures. And that's the real feature in this thing that I think I'll, that uh, sometimes the short-term weather uh, does improve the topsoil moisture, but... Uh, Last year, the one thing that kind of snuck up on everybody was the fact that the subsoil moisture really got depleted as, a, as the growing season went along. And then when the, uh, we had limited rains on the, uh, at the end of the growing season last year, oh, it's no big deal. The crops are already made. There won't be a big deal. And that, well, it ultimately had a big deal because we significantly changed the August yield of last year, 181 bushels down to 
final number, 172. That's nine bushels difference. And that's part of it is coming from the fact that the subsoil moisture was not there. And I think that's another feature that's a part of this year's crop. Uh, we just haven't had the snows and the wet weather, uh, you know, west of the Mississippi here, uh, all that significantly. Now, there's been uh, some rains that have come through and maybe even excessive rains. If you look at central Illinois, where they had 10 to 12 inches in a short bit of time. And there's chances for some more flooding maybe to come about on this uh, this weekend on into early next week with some of the forecasts that are now out there. So uh, to some extent, uh, there wasn't a, a wet hole or a drowned out spot in, east of the Mississippi until two weeks ago. Now there's more. So uh, ultimately, that's uh, most cases that means you got rain around that hole. And so you're going to still have pretty good yields, but you do lose some harvested areas uh, when you do have those things can occur. And so um, I think that's one of the big features that we look at on, uh, on Monday. Is the USDA going to make adjustment from their 179.5 bushel yield or are they in 50.8? <clears throat> are they going to stay with those? There has been many, many years they've stayed with those uh, trend line yields that they projected. They did, though, make some uh, adjustments in 2019 where they took the, their uh, U.S. yield down to 169 bushels. Uh, so I think there is a possibility that they might want to be realistic uh, on their current yield prospects. And, and I'm looking in the 176, well, really 177 level. I've seen other people in that same general range uh, of where they should be at this time and maybe around 50 bushels and beans. And that's a big, big, uh, that impact on uh, the recent adjustments in acreage is actually suggests that we might have a little less corn uh, than we thought we had uh, uh, when we had a million and a half uh, less uh, corn plantings in the U.S. That basically the adjustment downward on those yields to that level really kind of just basically brings your stocks level or brings your production levels, I should say, in corn right back to where they were. And that so that's a that's definitely a feature to keep an eye on, and, and how does the USDA deal with those numbers uh, on uh, Monday? Yes, uh, your big difference with the USDA uh, is in terms of yields. Yeah, that's the big feature. Uh, to some extent, the old crop demand levels and that. Uh, there might be a tweak going on in the uh, uh, ethanol numbers here. We've been continuing to run at pretty impressive levels here. I think this latest week, uh, uh, going into the 4th of July, we were at, uh, at uh, 2019 levels uh, on, uh, on uh, at the U.S. ethanol output. Uh, the, to some extent, uh, that's a scenario. I guess the real question becomes, uh, and the soybean side, I, I kind of feel like there's going to be a little bit of a spurt of uh, soybeans being pushed out of here once the uh, Brazilian crop exports kind of slow down and that. But at this point, uh, the 135 uh, million bushel number is in the in the realm of what's there. Uh, on the corn side, as I said, maybe 25 million adjustment. But then you switch over to the new crop side of things and uh, uh you know, it's really the production side numbers that are important. The only real exception I think we need to look forward to uh, in the numbers here for um, corn on the U.S. has been what we've heard and the adjustments we've had from the various people in South America on the impact of this uh, freezing temperatures that hit the Parin on uh, second crop corn down there. Uh, boy, there's lots of people looking at three to Four million metric tons being taken off those crops in the southern Mato Grosso and uh, Paranon and, and that. And even today, uh, Sassafras Mercado has been a little conservative on their numbers, actually slipped their numbers down uh, on their output uh, expectations. Now, interestingly enough, uh, yesterday, uh, the uh, Brazilian official estimate uh, came out with just a 3 million adjustment uh, from uh, or so uh, down towards 95 million metric tons from uh, uh, their 90 uh, 
or uh, 98 million numbers they had earlier here this year. So, but I've heard that that particular number was based upon conditions of maybe uh, 18 to 20 days ago. And uh, we've definitely had a switch there uh, on what's happened in the Southern part of this uh, country for sure. But um, uh, right now, at least, uh, we haven't really got a lot of uh, harvesting going on. There's been a little bit of things happening in, in Matto Grosso, in Matto Grosso at this point, but we're still quite a few days away for how the harvest is going to go in, in the uh, south central part of Brazil. And that has a, a really big market impact. I uh, was checking some numbers uh, yesterday. And Brazil is going to have a significant deficit of corn in some regions. And that can mean imports from the U.S. Very true. And I think that's a great point. And, and, and to f actually finish up the one thing that uh, talked about there, I, I think the USDA is really has to step up here and increase their new crop uh, corn exports Primarily, there's just what you talk about, the chance that they might import into Brazil, but also in the same situation is that Brazil won't be able to export the significant amount of corn that they did last year. And so that brings us back into the as a supplier of this corn. And, and it'll be this fall because of the fact that the Brazilian crop uh, exports will be significantly reduced uh, when you're talking about 102 million metric ton crop, and now you're going to potentially look at a crop at 90 or even less uh, this coming year uh, on that, that suggests that, uh, that I, I conservatively put in a um, 100 million increase in the USDA exports, but that might be short of the goal here as we get further into the uh, summer here and figure out exactly how the uh, Brazilian crop turns out to be, and, uh, and the, the Brazilians might end up importing some from Argentina, but the same situation, if Argentina doesn't export that, some people have to come to us, so I really think that the, the there's basically uh, it's Argentina, your, uh, us, and also Ukraine are the three sources of uh, corn around the world. At and this yet point. Uh, Paraguay has suffered with the same weather issues that it borders with the Brazilian state of Paraná. Very true. I, uh, that's, uh, and the, the, the twist of that is, is that they can't even get it down the river <laughs> to, to uh, Argentina to get it either exported through uh, Rosario or Buenos Aires. So, Man, it's it's a tough go for the for the farmers there in Paraguay uh, at this point between the weather and now uh, you know, the the amount of moisture that's uh, in the river uh, that's their lifeblood to get their exports out. Never want to be landlocked. Yeah, sometimes you feel like you gotta end up uh, having a port somewhere if you in your agricultural world. You've got to be able to get there without having to depend on somebody else. And right now, the interesting twist on it is that the Peregrines need to depend on Brazil to let some of the moisture out of the dam so it'll go by them to get all the way down to Argentina. So it's it's a uh, interesting little world that uh, that's happened in those three countries. And what are your concerns over the wheat world? Well, the wheat world is interesting at this point. Uh, we continue to... Uh, uh, see some uh, Pacific Northwest on winter wheat. And I think that's going to shave off some of the extra production numbers that it looks like it's going to come from the U.S. winter wheat uh, numbers from both hard red in the plains and soft red in the eastern Corn Belt and eastern U.S. Uh, from there. But the big twist is this is really the U North American, not just U.S. Uh, spring wheat crop, but Definitely the the uh, western areas of North and South Dakota and parts of Montana have really been hit hard by the uh, dryness and that. But that dryness does not stop just at the U.S. Canadian border. It's also swung up into uh, you know the prairies up there, the Canadian Western Prairies, and that. And there's been a lot of talk and issues about that this week, and that 
And I think the latest one I remembered seeing from the uh, USDA was a 32 million metric ton crop down from 35 million metric tons last year. I think that number is going to be revised downward. I also sense that the U.S. Uh, spring wheat crop could be 80 to 100 million less than what they have been uh, projecting in our total numbers. So surprisingly, our U.S. Uh, ending stocks and total crop could both decline here. Uh, the USDA's expectations for the 2021-22 year on carryover stock were 770 million, and I'm around 200 or 730 myself. That's down, I guess, for about 40 million. And I think a lot of people in the trade are looking for a smaller U.S. carryover stock. Now, the biggest problem in all this is is that. Uh, what really makes a difference is in the world uh, on wheat is what's going on in the Black Sea and what's going on in the European uh, common market. And uh, lots of reports that the uh, European uh, wheat crop is making a huge rebound from last year, probably in the 15 to 20 million metric ton level. That puts them competitive in uh, selling wheat to uh, North Africa and the Mideast. Same thing, uh, uh, I think, well, I don't, I'm not sure that uh, Russia's crop is going to jump dramatically. I think it's going to, it was 85 million last year. Some early ideas was 79. Now there's ideas it's 82 million metric tons. I think that uh, the interesting thing is that Ukraine is the other major producer of wheat in the Black Sea, and their crop is definitely going to be higher than last year. Uh, and so... Uh, you put that together, that's going to be, uh, they're going to continue to supply Egypt. And so uh, it's going to be quite interesting on the wheat crop here. I think some of the focus uh, on the U.S. winter wheat crop is going to start shifting dramatically to the northern plains and the spring wheat and what's going on there and their yields. And also across the border here on spring wheat uh, in uh, Canada, because interestingly enough, uh, this year's combination of weather uh, came through and the rains that we ended up having uh, in, uh, in May and in late April and May that uh, kind of improved the prospects for winter wheat and spring wheat, or excuse me, soft red wheat, uh, that also kind of washed out the protein level. Surprisingly, your best proteins are when things are dry. And so last year, the, the, the crop, Protein on hard wheat, hard wheat was 11.8, according to a uh, U.S. Wheat Association uh, update. And so it looks like it's about 11% this year. So now there's 8% difference now. Yeah, in most cases, that's not a big deal. But when you're making flours and, 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 and to make bread and things like that, you need a certain level of protein. And if we don't have as many bushels of uh, spring wheat to blend that in, then that's another feature. So they're, uh, interestingly enough, the flour manufacturers in the U.S. are quite talented about how to put together various wheats to, to, to get the same taste for the bread that you always like. But it's going to be more challenging this year than it usually is. All right. Your final thoughts, sir? Well, I have to say that uh, uh, next week is going to be quite interesting. The USDA is going to give us a, a base there of figuring out what's happening on where they think things are currently. I think weather will continue to be a feature. Uh, I've heard uh, projections uh, from some of the weather people that the last half of July here uh, might be a lot different than the first half of the month has been with the building back of this uh, heavy duty heat that's been out here uh, in the Rockies and further west. Uh, and that, and we can, uh, we're gonna continue to have weather as a, as a feature here on this thing going forward. I guess the volatility that uh, we've seen over the last uh, two or three months is probably still ahead of us a little bit. I'd have to say though that uh, that uh, using some good size rallies here on uh, uh, corn and soybeans and, and that uh, to finalize your old crop stuff is probably a good sense of things here. Because the one thing that does happen as we get towards the end of the uh, growing season, everybody sits and waits to see what's gonna happen on the harvest. And that's, uh, right now we're about two and a half months away. All right, thank you, Jerry. Have a great week. You bet, always good to talk. Have a good weekend.